Alright, we're gonna do it this way for now. Sorry about that, everybody. Everybody, good afternoon, good afternoon. That was a disaster at the beginning. Alright, let's get to it. Thanks for joining. What do we got here for comments? So, what we're going to start with today is we got a, a Bitcoin bounce back. And what I thought I would do, let's look at my main chart. What I thought I would do is take some blank charts and we're going to do a little bit of TA work. Uh, just some blank, because this is a very, very busy chart. Got all kinds of support and resistance and trend lines and so I'm going to take a blank chart and we're going to draw a blank chart on a couple of these pairs. And we might talk about a new project today. It's an interesting project. But we'll see if we get to that, if we have time. This is something I think Alan's been into. But... All right, possible dead cat bounce on. Hello, hello. We're getting a little bounce today. Yes, let's read these comments here. Possible dead cat bounce. I suppose it's possible, but remember that we're in an uptrend. Look at that trend. So typically, a dead cat bounce is on the way down, right? It's when you're falling. Now, you, and you're in a clear downtrend and you bounce. We'll see. I mean, this could be a early dead cat bounce. Look at look at the. Let's go to the the. Four, the we go back here. On the equities markets. But this might have been a dead cat bounce in the equities. But they recovered. I think a dead cat bounce is something that works more like this. Do we still have Chesapeake? Does anybody have the Chesapeake <laughs> equity? I don't even know if it's, it's on there anymore. These energy companies, right? So this, this is what I would classify as a dead cat bounce. All right, moving on, let's get, out of equity. Let's get back to crypto. But yeah, so we're getting a bounce. I don't think it's a dead cat bounce. We've had too much upward momentum. The buying is voracious. Macro thesis is all there. Gentle squeeze. So, uh, th so yeah, let's look at the daily chart here real fast. So last night I did that stream as we were selling off pretty hard. If we look at the four hour, I literally was live streaming as we did this first little bounce and then back down. And I said I thought that this was going to turn into... I, I, it might. I didn't, I didn't know, obviously. But I thought that this might turn into a big wick like this one was, right? Where we recovered pretty fast. And, you know, you look at any reasonable time frame, that, that basically this is going to be a giant wick down and back up. We'll quit jumping around the charts so I know that annoys people. Sand, CRV, API3, SNX, my top four performers this month. Hopefully it's just the beginning. Um, I know the other three. Sand, I don't know. Well, maybe we'll look at that. Maybe we'll look at that here in a minute. I wanted to find a project to just kind of show you guys how I kind of research them. And maybe we'll look at sand. The sandbox. Oh man, that thing spiked hard. Where is it at on the uh, 262? Let's take a look at the sandbox later. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. All right. Before we get going, I have some uh, usual announcements. First of all, thank you for joining the live stream. This is a Conquering the Markets community live stream. We work with uh, Jordan Lindsay, Conquering the Markets, and Heath. And uh, plug into the plug into Jordan's training methodologies and trading methodologies. So a lot of what you'll see I use. I don't entirely exclusively use Jordan's, but it is the like 90% of what I do now is just using Jordan's methodologies, so namely the time frames, the how we how we play uh, watch price action, uh, how we draw support and resistance and trend lines. I'm gonna take a sip of my cold brew, nitro cold brew coffee here. One second. 
So yeah, Jordan does the matcha tea, I do the coffee. So I got all kinds of coffees. Got my nitro cold brew this afternoon. All right. The volume of that wick was high too. Yeah, it was a high volume. You can see it. I was watching, uh, last night on the stream, we were watching the uh, Coinbase Pro feed. And it was just insane. All right. So uh, another, another uh, disclaimer. This is not a financial uh, live stream. This is an educational and this is not financial advice. So uh, furthermore, if you listen to me, you'll inevitably uh, lose all your money, lose a thousand percent, and end up living in a van down by the river. Now, you might have some good company because there might be a lot of us down there, but that's where you'll end up. So don't listen to me. I'm an idiot. Um, you lose all your money. All right. Sand is non-fungible tokens. Perfect. I wanted to talk about an NFT project. I actually wanted to explain what NFTs are. We're going to switch. I was going to talk about Ampleforth, but it's so complicated. It's so hard to describe. Um, I was a little worried about how, the, how would we have time to do that. So we'll switch to Sand, and I'm just going to research it with you guys. If it's an NFT, perfect. We're going to, we're going to research Sand. I want to give a shout-out to... Alan, I don't know if Alan's on the live stream right now. Uh, let, me, let me ping him real fast. Uh, live. So Alan is on Twitter now with us. He's at 20 ping 3. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Um, I highly recommend you follow Alan on Twitter. Um, you know, if you're not watching your Discord or whatever, it's another, another outlet. And um, he's, he's a masterful technical I don't know why this adds in there a TA and he's very very good at, uh, at crypto he understands technology very well and he's a very good at TA so I would encourage you to follow Alan over there at 20 ping 3 on Twitter all right enough for the uh, chatter all right let's, let's do some work here any more chat so we're gonna look at we're gonna look at sand then SNEW thank you for that but uh, Engine, yes, engine is one of my sleeper picks. I have a sleeper video, and engine is one of my sleeper picks. Let's do some TA, guys. I'm gonna start fresh with some technical analysis on the. Let's just do the daily chart here on Bitcoin, right? So one thing I know you guys all have. I don't know how many of you are, are tied in with CTM. We have a lot of non-CTMers. This is for the non-CTMers right now. All right. So the one thing I'm looking at right now is that on a reasonable time frame or any time frame, we're in an uptrend. Now, you can say we're in a downtrend at like this type, you know, one hour from the peak here, this swing high to this swing low area, uh, there's a bit of a downtrend, sure. So, um, but on any more long time frame, which we trade on, at least the four or the eight hour, it would be hard to say that we're in a downtrend because we have made a bit of a, lower low there but we made a higher low than there so i think it's still very much up in the air and i don't think that we're in a downtrend so the thing i'm looking at is trend lines right so where, where do i see a clear trend that has developed here we're going to start on the daily well we had we had a bunch of trends uh, all over the place there was one right here i can see clearly that i had this peak this peak that peak and then that price action through there that was a a downtrend uh, we broke that downtrend and that that was a trend reversal so that was our bear market phase right so we had a uh, our all-time high our swing our you know, bear market swing high there um, and then now I'm gonna go the other direction all right so now that I see that we've broken out now since we broke out I see an, an uptrend right and an uptrend that carried us into that breakout maybe there's one there the thing is, when you look at this, this big red wick is kind of an outlier. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ignore that big red wick and I'm going to see what other trend lines I have because I think that was an outlier. All right, so then I get a trend line there. That's interesting. So, the other thing to, to zoom in on now, so we've got these, these confluence of lower trend lines way down there. Now, let's go to a higher time frame here and I'm going to see what I see. All right, so now... I'm in a lower time frame. So now what I see is we've we've accelerated after we consolidated here. There was some consolidation right through here, clearly. And then we broke out. And now we're in a different trend entirely. So that trend that I see is this. So I see the top of a new channel that formed after breaking out, right? So somewhere maybe like that, right? There's the top of a channel. There was a channel that was obviously formed there. See all the touches that this channel had. 
So I see the top of a channel. Okay. All right. And then that's the bottom of this channel. You can draw it, you know, but really the meat of the channel, all it touches was there and we fell out of the channel. But we're back above that, that channel. So the price was pretty good inside that channel for a while. That's the basis of my, my analysis there on the, on the trend lines. All right, so I'm going to remove this because I just want to watch the top of the channel. I'm going to remove the other trend lines. This is what I'm watching right now. So the other thing that we've talked a lot about, the other, the other metrics that work out really well for me, um, the technical indicators that I use, uh, one, one really good one is the daily Jordan's true trend. That's a symbol indicator, sorry. True trend. Um, there we go. Let's go to the Bitcoin true trend, the BTC true trend. So this is a, a, a you know an oscillator. There's many many oscillators, but here's a true trend oscillator. And what we were talking about earlier, I mean you can see it, right? Any any anybody can see that you're in an uptrend. But this is kind of a, a if if you need a, a a simple way to tell what tr where your trend is at, just pull this up on the daily time frame, and you'll get you know, you'll get a real good sense of what the trend is. So I'm gonna close that. But the ones that I really, really personally like after having spent some time doing technical analysis, I found just the very simple moving average. And I want the basic simple moving average if it's, it's a built-in. And then I just do a search for some. simple moving averages. This is one that gives me a bunch. Yeah, I don't want that one. We'll just do the, that one right there for now. Let's close all this stuff. All right. So the simple moving average just has the 50, 100, and 200. The reason I use the moving averages is institutions use that, right? And so at computers, uh, algorithms are constantly watching just the simple moving average as well. Um, I, I don't like volume weighted ones as much um, because volume can be uh, a miss can misguide you I've found over the years so I just use the simple moving averages and I see uh, that gives me a trend like the simple moving averages is just a, I, I can see on the chart especially in trending markets like over here I might have a harder time my brain might have a harder time figuring out if we're in an uptrend or downtrend and looking at something like this you know obviously this is a swing high swing low uh, so I don't know you know and as we leave here I can say okay yeah we're definitely in an uptrend now right and it just helps guide my eye a little bit so I use the simple moving averages some the other thing that works that I found that actually really works is called the Fibonacci retrace levels. Oh, here's a simple one. Here, that's what I was looking for, the one, 50 moving, 50 day, or whatever time frame you want to look at. Those tend to work pretty well. We came pretty close to the 50 and found support there, by the way. Um, the, other, the other thing that definitely works are Fibonacci levels. Now, the problem I have with Fibonacci levels is they're very subjective in how you pick your levels. Now, in a trending market, it's not too subjective, right? So... Um, what you want to do is you want to pick out your swing high and your swing low um, for any impulse. So this is an impulse. And, you know, it depends on where you define where the impulse is, too. Sometimes impulses are harder to get than you would think when you start looking at it. But, for example, I could call this an impulse. This is my low, high, and then my retrace low. So what I'll do, and... A standard fib retracement is the easiest because then you can just kind of retrace based on a move where your retracement level should be on a, on the downside. All right, so you can flip this around and you can get a retracement level or an extension level based on some basic levels. The problem is extension, so retracement's easy. So let's, let's let me show you an example of a retracement. Let's go to the sell off here. Okay, so we had this sell off. I have my clear high, I have my clear low, and I want to see what my levels are. And there's your Fib retrace levels mapped out pretty easily based on when it retraces back into the price action that you were watching. So when you find your swing low moving forward, you can find some levels that might work. And you can see price interacted with it. Whether this was some other, this is just support, right? But that uh, 382 level became, you know, there's some price action there. So you can look at, this gives you a good read on some things. The problem, like with strong extensions, let me draw this from the bottom up here. It's another way you could have done this one, right? On the sell-off side, gave you some levels. The problem with extensions are finding a... Uh, and so what I, the reason I'm doing this is I have a hard time just figuring out exactly how to draw some of these things. 
So I'm just covering kind of what what I know. I know they work. I'm gonna draw. So this determining your impulse, the start of your impulse, and the end of your impulse, and then the, and then the end of the retracement. So I would say that this was the start of an impulse after we fought with resistance down. But I think the impulse really started way back here on the breakout. But let me show you how to use these extensions. So if, if you wanted to say this was the beginning of the impulse, this is the end of the impulse, and this is your sell-off point, this gives you a bunch of price levels to work with. Now I'm going to turn off auto. We can go back above here and we can see uh, based on our impulse up, and really the better impulse down would have been that level, and then moving forward. But if we draw it there, this can give you some good fib levels that might end up working a little well. What's interesting to see is where this goes. This takes us to 64,000 at the top of, of if, if this ends up being your total impulse for the last impulse, then your next impulse could go as high as 64,000, like, right? If that ends up being, how does this end up way down here? What do I do? I just messed that all up. I must have moved that down. Sorry, make that back. This is 90,000. All right. Um, let me go look at the comments here in a section in a second. But here's another tool. I just what I want to show is if anybody's wanting to use those tools on TradingView, you can go into this these built-in charts. Not this. I didn't mean to click that. Oh, where is the new strategies and indicators? It's a whole strategy. There we go. Uh, template. So there's a um, swing trading template that, that will put a bunch of really good swing trading tools on here for you. So on a daily time frame, so this tool picked out uh, 17, 580 as the, as the swing low and 11 or 49,000, you know, 41, 986 as the swing high. And it's still trying to figure out where the next. So if you, if you were to draw out your FIB levels based on that, that would give you some more levels. Now this is giving us traditional pivots. I'm going to change this to Fibonacci's and that'll help you give you some Fibonacci levels too if you want to use an automated tool. But what's cool about this is now it just gave me something to work with on what the computer thinks are the swing levels. So I'm going to go and draw a Fibonacci extension with those. It said, what did it say? 17? Yeah, it called this an impulse. Yeah, there you go. That makes sense up down retrace i guess that, that that didn't count and then it drew it down to here all right so that's your all right so that level and then i'm gonna turn off auto what i'm curious about is where these take us i'm gonna try to figure that out it takes us to 133. now the thing is we're gonna have multiple impulses we're not gonna have we're not gonna have a, a leg up and, and be the end of it we're gonna have multiples all right, I'm gonna get to the back to the comments. Now, I am when I used to do Fibonacci's, it was I never tried extensions because they were always too subjective to me. I just used retraces. So that would help give me some retrace levels. And you can see price did honor kind of this one here as it went down below it and held it. But it's a lot easier to do retrace. Alright, take a look. Trend-based extension trends work well when you're expecting symmetry in a move. I like them after a pullback and an uptrend. Yeah, I like grayscales. Okay, so let's go look at the comments. Oh my goodness, there's been so many comments. Type true trend, repeat history. Think ETH makes new all-time highs reasonably soon. Let's see, let's, let's see your Alan's answering questions like crazy while I talked about. Uh, I'm not a, uh, so the technical experts, the masters of at, at technical, <laughs> are definitely Jordan and Heath, and they're both. So if you look at my my YouTube page, the recommended channels that I have are Jordan and Heath, and they're the technical experts, right? So I'm uh, I mean as far as technical analysis, I'm more a technologist in that I understand technology and then I, then I can get crypto down. Let's just take a look. Let's just do a blank. So now I'm going to use just CTM methodology and just general price action. So the one thing that I found too is all these Fibonacci levels and everything else um, and, and even simple moving averages, um, they all work decently well for, for levels that 
are, that the market's going to find of interest. What you want to find is that all these indicators become self-fulfilling prophecies as far as I'm concerned. It's when, when it's when a critical mass of people are using them, then you can kind of figure out what the psychology of people, of, of, the, of other players in the market is going to be as you come into those levels, whether it's a moving average or Fibonacci level. Now, I don't use, I don't, I don't like taking action on them. I just prefer looking at price action alone and looking at horizontal support resistance, namely. And now, of course, when, with Bitcoin, we have a whole different set of, of things that we're analyzing to try to figure out what our upside target could be on a, on a price discovery basis. But all right, let's go to the comments again. Uh, you guys are just going at it. All right, I want to read this though. Nick says, trend-based extensions work well. So, yeah, you're expecting symmetry in a move. Yeah, and we're expecting explosive moves. So I was only trying to figure out, I've been working on the FIB levels to try to figure out some next impulse targets, and I just, I haven't found anything I liked. I'll tell you how I, I'm gonna show you all how I came up with this 30, uh, let me go back to my other chart. I did this last night. I showed how I came up with this level right here, the 32,000, which seemed to really, price seemed to really like to interact with that level, but we did drop below it. And guess what? That level, this is a FIB level I came up with. Let's just let's just delete it, and I'm gonna tell you why. I went through all that FIB level work and the talk and everything else. This was a key Fibonacci level, and I think it was like 44,000 or something. I had, I, I did a, I tweeted out here. Let me just go back to my, my tweets. I tweeted out the chart, how I came up with that. Yeah, there's my levels. All right. And then it was thirty-six thousand, and then forty. But you see how the top end of the of of the uh, pattern didn't reach um, the top of that next fib level. We did interact with it to a degree, but look, it came back to this trend line. That's what it ultimately came back to. So that trend line was more important to us than a Fibonacci level. Um, the Fibonacci level did help to maybe if you were trying to be active about trading it as you came into this level right here. And if you're looking for sell-offs here, but it didn't save you because it sold off below that that third time down, and the trend line is where it caught. Which the trend line might have been maybe influenced by moving average a little bit. I'm not sure. So all that to say that those are those are people. I've, people have asked me what I, what I use, um, and that's I'm just trying to answer that basically. Um, and this is why I've gone back to look. I just use price <laughs> and trend lines and support horizontal support and resistance. I let the I try to let the market show me what it likes and not predict it, right? I try to, um, you know, like I said, there's a big difference. Any any indicator to me that's predictive, I have a, I, I have a harder time trusting. Um, although somebody did post an Elliott wave showing, I forgot who that was. I need to find who it was in the Discord showing Ethereum going back down to a thousand dollars, and I said, nah, it's not going back to a thousand dollars. It was up here, and it sold right off right within a few bucks to a thousand dollars. So. I need to find out what he was doing for that uh, Elliott Wave work because that one was pretty good. I've seen Elliott Wave be so way far off. My problem with Elliott Wave is it's really, really hard to um, figure out the, the impulses until after they've played out. You know, anybody has any thoughts on that? A lot of finance people say BTC goes down a bit, buy it around 20K is interesting. Institutions won't buy more, some say they're 20 25K. Pullbacks, yeah, so uh, Alan just put, pullbacks tend to be 30%. So this was exactly, I tweeted that, right? I don't know if y'all follow us on Twitter, but I tweeted, we're at exactly at 30, 30%. Last night, when we hit 30%, I, actually, I put in a tweet as we hit 30%. And I said, as of right now, the, the sell-off is 30%. If you're waiting for a time to get back in, this is it. You might go down, and I said another 10%. Um, but this is the safe. This is the safe entry right now. And if you would have bought at thirty percent off, bought back in, you know, if you were down, if you went down another ten percent, being underwater ten percent for a short period of time isn't the end of the world. But there's our forty percent sell-off level. Let's take a look at that. That's twenty-five thousand, right at. Now I'm gonna throw the. Oh, I got rid of the SMA. I got all these indicators here that I have favorites. That's what it is. It's not. It's just under MA. That's the nine-day MA. I'm gonna put the fifty back on here. So yeah, going back to key levels. Um, I would. This is a. A pretty key level right here at 34, right at 34,000, 34,029. 
That's where our close and open were on those daily candles. I'm gonna look at some weekly levels real fast. So we had a close and an open on a weekly there at 33, exactly 33. Notice the humans like round numbers and there's a lot of humans involved in trading this right now too. So a lot of algos buying it, but so it comes in right there at those candles. Okay, that was our weekly levels. All right, moving on. Brandon, I'm not an idiot for selling my BTC and buying more ETH. Am I? <laughs> uh, no, I don't think you're an idiot, but I, I, I hope you didn't sell all your Bitcoin to buy ETH. -E. Um, I do think ETH is going to outperform. Let's go look at the ETH chart. This is a fresh, clean ETH chart. We're way detached from the moving averages right now. Let's get rid of those. Let's look at the ETH USD chart. All right. So something we had all mapped out before. Can you want to look at look at key closes? Look at the weekly. Here's our weekly levels. Let's just draw these in on the on the chart. There's a weekly close and open, and another weekly close and open, and then an all-time high. Okay. So now let's go back over to our price action. Now we are below these two, which will act as resistance. It looks like we are above that other weekly, which will be support. All right, that's the first thing I look at. Secondly, on ETH, obviously, we're in an uptrend. Check this out. I'm just, I'm just seeing, I'm just like, I'm, I'm going to put this back on auto here. All right, um, there's that. Possibly. What I was looking at is these touches here are kind of starting to line up to a very parabolic looking move. But we're so far up here. I'd look at what I have my trend lines at otherwise. I don't really like those after I look at it now. I'm on the one day. This is your, this is like a trend line here. Is this a, there's obviously a better trend line in here. So there's some trend lines. We're way above that. We're way detached from that. Let's go down to the four hour. All right. Then let's draw that other trend line I was trying to find a second ago on the, is that attached to anything back here that makes sense to work with? Not really. We're getting very parabolic here though. That's for sure. Horizontal is going to matter much more here with this price action. I don't like. I haven't worked on the USD chart hardly at all on ETH. But we obviously are in a strong, strong uptrend. And somebody else probably has some good trend lines here. But uh, what do I see on a four hour? Hmm. Yeah, we got like a channel forming up here. Probably got the channel off. So it needs to be, so the other thing too is touches. You need to go like wick to wick or body to body typically and not the other way around on trend lines. So either respect bodies or respect wicks. Does that line up to something? I don't really like it too terribly much. I've been working much more on the ETH to BTC chart. Yeah, there's obviously a trend forming there. All right, let's go to the ETH BTC chart. I was gonna do XLM. So I've got marked here, by the way, on the right is these are the tickers we're looking at in the USD and BTC. Let's take a look at the comments here. I just, um, and what I'm, the other thing I'm looking for and yeah, this is a little bit cleaner to me. I like this one better. The reason I like this one better is I had this, you can see here in a longer time frame, we had a clear downtrend and we we're in a trend reversal. Did that even draw back to there? No. But yeah, we had a downtrend, touch, 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 all the way down here. You might draw that down a little bit. And then we broke out. Now, on the other end, I don't think I have any trend lines drawn in for this price action. I just have the horizontal levels I'm working with, which on the ETH BTC chart are pretty clear to me. 
So I got the tops of these and that little wick down there. Um, I clearly have that support now. Clearly have resistance above us. That's at 333, oh, 0333. And then above us, I've got the top wick there. Now I'm not going to bother drawing a second resistance at the bodies here. Because momentum upward is going to take you probably into that. Oh, is it 0461? 04, though, is the main level to watch um, once we get above it. So on the upside, I'll be I'll be watching to see what happens as we come into 04. So I guess, in theory, I should draw it at 04 first to see what we do there. And I'm expecting it to go up to 046. But you see a body on the daily. We, op we, uh, open, we close there and open there. So we got a little bit of work to do to get up into the 04 area. And then... The market's shown us that it's like at this level right here lately. So that's our open, our close, our last close, and then our open, and then this wicks and touches here. And so we have, you know, we're clearly on a, we're still in a long-term downtrend. So keep that in mind, right? So for us to really turn around the trend, we need to, we need to be actually going this direction for a period of time. All right. I'm gonna get. I'm done with the the TA walkthrough. But let's go to some questions here. All right, Brandon. Looks like ETH E2. Okay, so crypto stocks have been falling this afternoon. Don't know why. Maybe an indication. Uh, I did a video again on. Now that I can say this, man. I have a lot of videos now that I've done. Mara and what did I just do? Mara and. Stocks, one stocks. Riot, let's see what they're doing today. Yeah, I said that once they peak out and start to fade, they'll continue to fade as Bitcoin recovers. And that's what I that's what's what I observed last market cycle, and that's what I think is gonna happen here. Let's go let's go look at Riot specifically, it's a little bit bigger name. Let's look at the last market cycle. Now he peaked out when Bitcoin did in December, but look at this. You know, Bitcoin was rallying, so this is October. See all this price action here? See this little peak right here? Way back here and so if you would have if you would have bought into this peak right here, November late, you know, late 2016, Bitcoin was rallying this whole time while Riot was just flatlined. And then it spiked here and it spiked hard at the end when when Bitcoin made its big move, but it you know, there was a time if you would have bought here, you could have wait the whole cycle to be above. Now let's go look at that on the Bitcoin if that's the stock you're talking about, maybe that's the stock you're talking about. Let's go look at that on the BLX long-term chart here. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to my clean chart. This is my clean Bitcoin chart, more or less clean. Now that I marked it up some, I'm going to get rid of some of this stuff. I'm going to overlay Riot's stock price. All right. So, last cycle, notice, did Riot keep up with, this is Riot's blockchain's stock price last cycle. Did it keep up with Bitcoin? No. Bitcoin, from the beginning of the market cycle, which, let's say just from the beginning of 2016. So it depends on where you zoom in and zoom out to. But, from the beginning of 2016... So you see the interaction here. We had these random spikes and then fades, but then it started. Bitcoin started a rally and it stayed flat. So, you know, we're we we just did something like this, or this. I don't know which one. You know what what it definitely equates to. Um, I I would imagine that we're actually going to probably sell off and then go sideways as Bitcoin does this. So I think. Yeah, look at look at that last cycle. It just it underperformed and it had these random spikes. Is the main takeaway I had. Look, see these random spikes that it has. But last time was a much smaller space, so this time might be quite different. I don't know. This is just why I'm not excited about the miners, is that A, they underperformed Bitcoin last cycle, and they just are very random about how they behave. So if you're in the mining stocks, that's why I'd be a little cautious of those. Oh my goodness, so many comments. Did I miss the ADA Club? The ADA Club, let's look at ADA's price action. Let's look at a clean chart. Let's do ADA USD real fast. Daily. Oh, you know what? I don't like this. I, put, I randomly chose a bit for next. We still don't have enough history here. I don't 
don't like working on charts like that. So A to BTC, I mean, there's not enough history here really to work with, but something clearly you see here is this, this key level right here. Came down into it, bounced off of it, finally broke through it, came back, tested it as resistance, failed to, to found resistance at it multiple times, and now we're above it, and it's now going to supply support. That's the A to BTC chart. That'd be the main thing I'd be watching on this. And honestly, I mean, it's just, that's going to provide resistance right there. Where we're at right now. Continue to consolidate underneath resistance. I mean, that's what we're doing right now is we're just consolidating. Let's go to a 12-hour, 4-hour time frame. We're just consolidating under resistance here. All right, they dilute miners, seek the leverage. Oh man, I'm missing a whole bunch of comments down here. Curve, they're focused on creating high liquidity, centralized stable coin exchange, prevents slippage. Yes, Curve is a cool project. If I go back here, I've got them on my watch list too. They were, they spiked big time early. The only problem I have with Curve is I can't take leverage trades on them and crack it. All right. Ada means island in Turkish. I think, yeah, and Ada may mean island in Turkish, but you know, Ada was named after Ada Lovelace. That's where the, the name came in from. Got a Turkish lesson. <laughs> yeah, so we're talking about layer two. Layer two scaling is a big deal. So I've got um, on here, where are my layer two scaling solutions? I'm about to move them down. Oh, that's right, because I don't have them on somatic and loop ring. What's loop oh, LRC? Um, those are a couple of the, the layer two scaling solutions. ETH's gonna need some help, that's for sure. Uh, synthetics, loop ring, um, and, and, and matic, and there's other is it EIP 1559 is coming online too. Any DeFi plays you're looking at? Um, here's my watch list of the main projects I'm looking at. Let's go. Let's go do that one research on that one project. Um, Ren is an interesting one. Uh, I don't know. Can I buy it on Bitcoin? Or... So these are the these guys are the uh, backers of USD Coin. Is that right? Ren, 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 Ren. No, no, no. They 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 meant a, a stable coin. Hold on. I'm gonna say it's USD coin, but um, interoperability, Bitcoin, Zcash, wrap Bitcoin, yeah, wrap Bitcoin, WBTC, that's, it. that's what I was thinking. Okay. What did I say? Did I say wrap Bitcoin? Um, so, yeah, they're the ones that do wrap Bitcoin. Um, Ren is an interesting one for sure. Maybe I should have talked about Ren today. Um, but I've said this uh, like before, this is why I didn't think that. Uh, Litecoin or these other projects have a future because um, you know the ability to put, uh, create an ERC20 token on Ethereum and or ERC20 like wrapped tokens on other much faster uh, blockchains is going to be what I think most people end up using for transactions in the cryptocurrency space for settlement you know between projects or, or whatnot. So I, th I think Bitcoin's just going to be used. That's why I don't think Litecoin, you know, you, you keep seeing the, the charts. Litecoin's, you know, not doing anything versus Bitcoin, which is what matters. Yeah, Litecoin's still, I said, if it gets above this 005 level, I might be interested in, in a trade on it. But it's just dying, and I, I think it will continue to do so. I don't, I don't think Litecoin's going to get any reasonable strength this whole is you can see something here another thing it's downtrend you also probably want to break that downtrend so get above that that 005 level and above that tr that trend line and i might be interested in looking at it um all right so that's that so ren would be one and i don't know why it's not flagged on here um ave is interesting it's a super crazy project um it's an algorithmic stablecoin, and um, it's really complex. What was the other one? Somebody asked to look up one earlier. Hold on, when we first got started, they had one. Sand. Let's look at sand. Let's all look at sand together. 
And so non-fungible tokens, what are non-fungible tokens? Let's just start with that. All right. So if you want to create a token for an asset in the real world, per se, and it's, or it's, it's, a, it's a token that cannot be, it's not very, it's not a liquid asset. Um, and so non-fungible tokens can be like, I can create a token for a rare, um, say, trading card of some type in the real world. Or I can create a non-fungible token for something in, uh, you know, like a video game item. So I can make a token. Now when I get this token, I get the sword of whatever, right? I get the Lich, Lich King's sword, whatever it's called. I forget what it's called. Something like that. Um, in, in an in-game asset. So it's it's non-fungible. See here, there's a definition of it on understand. It says right here. So so where I start when I research projects is I just go to CoinMarketCap. I go find the project. So I just type in sand. I'm going to go down here. I'm like, all right. Uh, I don't care about the price action. I don't care about what is this thing. Sandbox claims to be a virtual world where players can build, own, monetize their game experience and the Ethereum blockchain using sand. Sounds like engine. Uh, upload them to the marketplace, drag and drop, experience, sandbox game maker. Okay, further, just claim that sandbox. So, what is the main difference between sand and engine would be my next question. So, what I do is I go over and most likely they, you know, the news section. So some teaser, YouTube trailer, and then so here's their website. I finally found it. The Sandbox. Now, hopefully they have a project. So let's just do the Sandbox. Sandbox coin. Let's see if they have a, about the Sandbox. Crypto. Um, all right, SAND is a utility token used throughout the Sandbox ecosystem's basic transaction ERC-20 token. Does anybody have the G2 and what's the difference between SAND and ENGINE? I'd like to know that. That's what I'm trying to find right now. Are they at Copycat? Are they related to LAND? Selling assets. I'm looking for like normally they have the white paper in the about me section. About here you go white paper. That's what I'm looking for. My goodness gracious. All right. So then what I do is I don't bore bore you guys with it, but it's a DAO organization. Non fungible tokens. Is this is what's the, what game is this? That blocky game that I, I never played. Mine Minecraft or something like that. Is this, is this that actual game? Does anybody in the comments know? Is this actually Minecraft that they're showing here? Or is this like their video game? It just has like a Minecraft looking feel to it. I don't know. So then I'll skim to the white paper here. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. What is sand? What is it used for? Blockchain games and NFT. Let's go here. Sand is part of sand toolbox. It's an ERC-20 token, access to the SAN platform, player spin, governance, staking, fee capture, foundation. What do we plan to do next? I'll link to something there. Historical background. Okay. I want to know, lands or blockchain-based virtual assets? Yes, yes, thank you. So, purchase trade. Okay, the use case for sand. Yeah, we, we all get it. We get it. It's non fungible token, video game tokens. But the problem is, what makes you different than the incumbent? Hmm. So, I'll have to go through here and see. Okay, Roblox and Minecraft with blockchain, the sandbox, true ownership. Okay, I see. So, they're, they're showing like... So is the sandbox actually a video game? Does anybody here know anything about this? Engine is the king of EFTs, I agree. So I, what I'm trying to figure out is, is this a video game as well, that they created a game plus the digital? It looks to me like, so true ownership of in-item games. So the big thing they're, they're marketing is obviously true ownership. You actually own the in-game items. So it's a, a token that you get that's, that's you know, 
versus, uh, I guess, you know, the assets are stored in the game. It's, it's hard to prove ownership, yada, yada, yada. I get it, but I'd have to go through here and find their, if there's anything technically different about them. I don't see anything right now that's technically different about them. But something to keep an eye on. They got a big pump in price. Let's see if I can find them at all. Sand. I got a crypto. Sand Tetheris. That'll work. All right, so it popped recently, so somebody's interested in it. I don't know if it's a pump and dump or if this is um, going to be sustainable or not. Oh my goodness, I'm like, there's a bajillion comments. I tell you, I got my mouse way up here at the top of comments, and I've been talking about this, and people are like commenting, and I've missed about 4,000 comments. All right, until I receive my Bitcoin money, do you know it very fast? Let me go back up here. Great, spending some time here listening to something very new. Thanks. I will come back again. The sandbox term derives from the nature of a sandbox that lets children create nearly anything they want with it. Makes sense. So is it, a, is it a development environment? I just saw this, what the F <laughs> says. Sandbox is a great company for making mock-ups of games. So is, is it a, is it an environment, like a development environment as well? So is it more than just a, just a crypto, it's actually like a development environment? Let's go back here, maybe I missed something big. Let's go to create. Oh, it's a game maker. Oh, this is totally different. This is not just non-fungible tokens. Awesome. This is the difference. Thank you. My goodness. So they have a, um, uh, I guess, I don't know if it's a developer toolkit or a full um, framework. Looks like it's a full framework. Yeah. Look at this. Anyone can build 3D games for free. No coding required. Okay. So it's just, okay. Got it. Got it. Download Game Maker. I might play with this later. All right. So this is different than Engine. Engine's all about allowing other game makers to put NFTs inside their games. This has a game engine associated with it. Of course, Engine might have a game engine too, actually. Solution. Software. Yeah, there's a gamification capability with an engine. I know that. They have, a, they have an SDK for... Create blockchain achievement supports. I don't think. I don't think. Does anybody tell me if I'm wrong? I don't think Engine has a game. In, engine itself isn't a game engine. <laughs> uh, whereas it looks like Sandbox is a bit of a game engine that you can just then snap snap in your own game for. And it has NFTs built into the capability. The, that's the difference. All right, cool, cool project to keep an eye on. Thanks for bringing it up. I like it. Let's look at their chart. Chart's very simple. So it's, it's, it's a standard crypto chart. This is versus USD or USDT tether. I was going to talk about Ample too, because if you're worried about action against tether um, or regulation there, uh, Ample's the algorithmic driven stable coin is interesting if they start to crack down on stable coins in general that are backed by US dollars or other assets. Um, I don't have much on this chart. I mean, it was totally sideways and just all of a sudden broke out. I guess if you were watching it closely, you probably could have caught this breakout, right? And that is, that's it's a breakout. It's a standard breakout trade right there. Right through here, though, is where your other level would have been. Touch. 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 Not all this. So that horizontal level is what's going to help you out there, but I don't have much to go on. It's an interesting thing to watch, though. Thank you. I will, uh, where is sand available? Let's go back. So another thing to keep in mind is how do you buy these things? So coin market cap. We'll go and we'll find sand. I don't want to log in right now. I'm live on YouTube. Thank you. All right. So if you go down here, you'll be able to see markets. All right, so there's no derivatives of it, but spot markets you can buy it on Upbit. You can buy it on Binance. Wow. Okay. You can buy it a lot of places. It's even on Kyber. Well, well, of course it's on Kyber. It's an ERC20 token. I'm stupid. Um, 
So Binance has it though. I'm guessing it's an ERC20 token. I must, I, did I read that about it earlier? All right, enough on sand, thank you. Um, yeah, we don't have much to talk about other than, you know, we had this bounce back and we're all just kind of sitting around waiting on price action. Let's look at setups. Let's go look at setups across the crypto landscape from the main pairs. Coming on to four hours, um, we'll start with Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin's back above this kind of fib, fib level we talked about earlier um, that I had marked out we've been interacting with we're resuming back off of that trend line so that trend line did end up on a longer time frame like a 12 hour held yep all right back to the four hour you know if you're if you're not already in bitcoin hopefully we get a retest of say this level and then a resumption but this was your buying opportunity as a lot of us pointed out for you yesterday Who is using or needs ETH? You need ETH as money to pay transactions. Oh, answering. Thank you so much, Alan, for answering all these questions that I can't get to. This is awesome. Um, that's a whole bunch of old questions. All right, let's go back to the old questions here that I missed. I like ETH. Yeah, so you sold, you sold everything for ETH. I mean, I like ETH because it tracks Ethereum. It's like your only option for pure Ethereum play that I know of right now if you're in the States. So ETH, you more like so how you play ETH -E, for how I do it is I, I watch the ETH charts, ETH USD chart, and then I take a look at what the premium's doing on ETH E. So if I'm if I'm really being active and trying to trade it right now, the premium looks like it's probably compressed. Um, and I would go look at the nav and see where we're at on the premium. Um, and you want to buy, you want to sell in premium expansion. So when the premium gets ahead of the price action and it's pretty dislocated from the price action, you have a, a very large premium, um, you know, 40, 50% or more. That's when you want to sell. And then you want to buy back when the premium gets collapsed and compressed. So I've been buying all through here. So I, I started, I mean, I actually started probably buying up here back, uh, into ETH. So I, I've, you know, I've been, I've been, I've been averaging down all through here. So the next time that ETH starts to really run, after we get out of these doldrums here, we fight with this prior all-time high and break out here, that X premium is going to expand. So most likely ETH E will be like a one point, you know, up to a 1.5, more like a 1.2 or 1.3 multiplier on what the price action of Ethereum is out of here. Um, and then I will use that opportunity as as Ethereum hits my price targets to to trim ETH E and then look to rotate back into GBTC or whatever else has uh, the lowest premium at the time. So like BITW we played, played this spike in BITW um, and then I've been buying back into BITW um, because it's, it's had a compressed premium. So I bought I think here and, and over here, it's had a compressed premium versus the others. So I'm basically just ex excelling on, on premium expansion and rotating into into others that have a lower premium. And also as price action dictates, of course, of the underlying asset. But I'm not super actively trading Bitcoin, so I just shave a little bit off one or the other and maybe rotate it as, as price dictates. But I don't, on these, I'm not like actively trading in and out of these. I'm just shaving one to move funds to another that's more attractive based on what the premium is doing. Or if, you know, I've shaved, I saved GPT, actually I did sell a little bit of GPT to come up in like 40,000, but it's because I was actively rotating over to ETH-E. For example, so the last time I sold GBTC, I sold a little bit, maybe like 5%, you know, uh, somewhere up here above, you know, right around coming into 40,000, I think, and rotated it over to ETH because I was anticipating that. I was anticipating this move that ETH made, this breakout that ETH made. Back to price, okay, curve. Old, so those are old comments. Go back to the new comments. my opinion on RSR is it a reserve rights crypto oh man uh, it's a stable coin another stable coin asset 
I haven't read up enough on RSR. I was trying to remember if there was something specific about it. Um, there was something specific about it. Okay, hold on. The second token, okay, so it's, it's a desert dual token, set up stable coin, backed by a basket of assets. So it's another basket for the stable coin used to keep RSR. Yeah, so it's a stable. Uh, like, I'm not too ter like unless you're talking about like maybe like I'm not too terribly interested in stable coins. I'm more interested in derivative players right now because stable coin regula regulation could be coming. Or I'm looking at like Ampleforth, which is like an algorithmic stable coin, um, is interesting because it could help kind of save the stable coin space if if st uh, stable coin crackdowns do come that are backed by fiat as as governments start to try to crack down on crypto. So I'm more, I, I care more about derivatives, which would be like RENs, wrapped Bitcoin, um, or synthetics, than I do about uh, stablecoin. And then, and then very, very different stablecoins like a Ampleforth or Ample. Um, those are the ones I would um, watch you more. So any stablecoin maker, I'm not too terribly interested in right now. I think that's. So it's ample forth is kind of very complicated, but it's algorithmic um, driven, and you get paid for being a holder of it, supplying liquidity to it. You get you get paid more ample, but it's still a capped asset. It's interesting. It's weird. It's interesting. All right, bought the synthetics in the dip. Awesome. Great spending some time. Well, the comments are getting kind of. I respect your opinions, but I'm more they suggest. Ada price predictions, please. Smile, I'm sorry to miss your comment a long time ago. If you're still here with me, let's go for an Ada price prediction. Um, all right. To do this justice, I gotta do this. So I don't think we're gonna do any sort of move like this, but I'm gonna measure this. Um, so from December 2017 to uh, January 2018, right? Is that right? Not very long. It had a, it ran 1,700% or something insane from, was it actually 7 cents to $1.40? Why on my chart do I have 0, 02, 0, what is all this? I'm like, why, why are these on my chart? Oh, that's bizarre. You'll see the tags over here. Do I have, I have a compare on something? Anyway, that's messing me up. Sorry, guys. All right, so $1.40 is what it hit last time, and it made a, you know, stupid, crazy move. What percentage I'm doing? So 1,800% move from um, seven cents to a dollar forty. Is that right? All right, and then we sold off. Obviously, been in the doldrums. All right, so an 1,800% move, which would be astronomically ridiculous. I don't think it's going to do that, but. Well, it might do more than that, actually. <laughs> Depends on where where the price started. So mainly, here's here's my here's my thoughts on on price targets for uh, Cardano based on historical price levels. I think we can double this pretty easily this cycle, um, and I'll be looking to sell a shave at about three dollars. But I'm also watching fifty cents, you know, a dollar, and then what are my other levels here? What? You might tell me why I have all these point one three. Why are these? Well, let me just get rid of all these lines. It's messing me up. All right. Um, I'd I'd be looking at three dollars. There's a couple reasons for that, but. Let's look at 1800% was that, that last move upward. I don't know if we're going to get 1800% move at the end here, but 
the levels to watch on get rid of this auto on Cardano are 51, 43. Hold on, let me put this here. So we obviously came into the same level 40, right, right about 40 cents. It's really 40 cents, 51, 52 cents. There's another no level over there. I don't have a good way to give you my reason for watching three, but it's two X. So all well, with the first move out of the breakout, Bitcoin did a two X roughly of its prior all time high. So in the immediate future, what I'm looking at is for these instruments to two X when they break their all time highs. Let's put it that way. So for example, on Ethereum, you know, I think once he breaks out a two X roughly of the, of the prior price action, is roughly what I'm looking at. It's way up here, you know, 3,000. So we'll see if it if it makes a move like Bitcoin did, Bitcoin 2x. But I think that's what's 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 coming up when these instruments break their all-time high. So ADA's got a lot of work to do to get back to its all-time high. This is also why I don't like watching the USD charts because I'm I'm struggling right now to go. I don't know what what the price target's going to be um, because I have to know really what the Bitcoin price is to give you a good answer on that. And so it's it's more of a you know the ratio of to Bitcoin that matters to me. So let's go look at that. That's more impactful. So currently we have a very large potential move ahead of us to catch up with where Bitcoin has gone to. And so if we gain ground on Bitcoin, I think I think I did the math and at a peak valuation, if we were to match this peak on the uh, Cardano to Bitcoin chart, we would be at like a $10 Bitcoin at, I mean, $10 uh, Cardano at, you know, at a 100K Bitcoin or something like that. So that's how I do the math. And I'd have to stop and do the math for you right now. But what I came up with is $10 is kind of the very, very up end of where we could get to this cycle. And I'm, I'm really looking for $3. And uh, when we break the all-time high, I'm going to see what happens right around $3 to shave. That's, that's my thoughts. So I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm going to be much more reactive to watching these charts than I am going to be worried about the price versus the US dollar myself. So I have a hard time answering that question just because... That's not what I'm focused on. So really, if I were to if I were to distill it down to what I'm focused on, I'm focused on this 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 swing high right here. I'm I focus on what happens when we come into, you know, forty two oh one Satoshi level. And right now we're at a thousand. Right, we're at a thousand Satoshis. Is that right? Thousand Satoshis, and when we come up in here into 4,000 Satoshis, that's a 4x move versus Bitcoin. That's what I'm more focused on than I'm focused on the price in US dollars. I hope that answers your question, I hope that helps. So the levels on the Bitcoin chart, which I think are much easier to gauge and much more reliable to, to trade on, um, are, for, so right now we're at 1,000 Satoshis, about 1,479 Satoshis, that level there. And then you had this swing high over here, which is going to provide a lot of resistance at 19 to 20,000 Satoshis. Now you could, you, know, you could blow that out and go to that swing high there. You see on this chart where I've got this swing high would actually probably be more applicable, but you're going to come into resistance there as well, where those bodies are and that wick is. And then you have another one there. A couple of resistance levels to watch there. And that's how I'd play it. So I answer, hope that answered your question. For interest, BTC Fib extensions. Try these three points. Swing low. Okay, thanks, Nick. Let's do Nick's. Uh, let's 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 do Nick's extension right now. Any thoughts on Stellar? I love Stellar. Uh, Stellar is so you see right here. I have Ethereum, Cardano, Link, Dot, XLM, and, and clean charts to talk to. Uh, Stellar is one of my clean charts. So just take that what you will. As much as I talk about Cardano, Link, and Polkadot, uh, I also threw um, the DeFi perp chart on here. So it's a good gauge of, of what the hot item. So the Bitcoin dominance chart and the, all the altcoin charts are useful, but I've been watching DeFi more closely lately. So DeFi perp, um, this is the perpetual uh, index uh, futures for DeFi names. Um, but the fact that I put Stellar on here to talk about and the clean chart should tell you something. Let's leave it at that. You think it takes out, Cardano takes out $2? Wow, 10 is crazy. 
Uh, yeah, 10 is crazy on Cardano, but that's, that's based on the math that I looked at, like right around 100,000, and 100,000 should be conservative for the bull market cycle in Bitcoin. So right at $100,000 Bitcoin, if, if Cardano were to catch it, now it won't. So here's the thing to keep in mind. I'm assuming that Bitcoin, like last cycle, what happens is we get this inversion, this final inversion as Bitcoin's selling off, that the altcoins are ramping like crazy. And so the way I did the math is actually 140,000 Bitcoin. If 140,000 Bitcoin as that sells off, and as as the alts, so I came up with between 90 and 100 thousand dollars on the downside on Bitcoin is right where the alts should peak out, and that's why I did the math on um, where would Cardano be at 100 thousand dollar Bitcoin as Bitcoin's coming off of a tie. And somebody wants to do the math for me at 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 if if. Uh, I pull up my calculator here real fast, but for like a price prediction, if Cardano were to hit 0.4, there's no way it's hitting that level. That's not right. This is USD. <laughs> All right, there we go. 8,000. So if we hit 8,000 Satoshi, is that $8? Not $100,000 Bitcoin. Is that $8? Actually, eight seventy dollars um, Cardano. Somebody fact check me. That may be eight seventy Cardano. So there you go. That might be your high-end price target right there. As as Bitcoin's selling off, and these alts are going in fuego, you know, thermonuclear, um, it might be more like eight something. But somebody check my math on that. I'd appreciate it. And I think the reason I think I came up with uh, with ten dollars too is that I th I think that Bitcoin's going to overshoot the one hundred and forty, so it might be coming down off of like something in the two hundreds as well. So that's also why I think ten dollars is impossible. Not likely, but possible. Um, Innocent. All right, so Nick. I'm sorry, Nick. I was I got distracted by answering the Cardano question. Let's look at let's do Nick's uh, fib extension experiment. Now again, I don't I, I don't want to distract people with, with talking about these technical levels. I'm just talking about technical levels that I've seen actually work. I've seen fib levels uh, actually work, but more in range bound markets. I've not I've not been able to see, make them work in extension price discovery but let's look at nicks okay so he says three points swing low uh 11 january so 11th of january so i'm gonna go to a higher fidelity chart if we're talking just the month of january then we go to a four hour so here's our beginning so the 11th of january that swing low okay next swing high also 11th of january just This swing high, not the next day. Okay, so intraday. So uh, the intraday on the 11th, basically. The sell off and then the bounce on the 11th. Okay. And then the swing low on January 12th. Okay, I like it because it's, 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 it's across two days. Okay, let's try that. So we're going to grab our FIB extension tool. And that one is trend based FIB extension. All right. So we're going to start with our swing low on the 11th and then our swing high, that's the 12th on the 11th and then our low on the 12th. Nick, tell me if I did that right. But there's your swing low level and let's draw these out. So let's just draw some horizontals on the fib level. So the 618 right there. I'm going to make these blue. We got our one. So this is double. So this this next line I'm going to draw represents double the swing delta. Um, which is a significant level. And then I'm going to draw where our swing low was. All right. So there's your kind of main levels. And then now for extension levels, let's see what we got here. Just got a curiosity. We get an extension at 47. Let's go check Nick's comments. Swing high is the 12th. Okay. All right, Nick, let's redo that then. So we go from the this swing high right here. That makes more sense to me. Thank you. And then back to the swing, same swing low on the 12th. Or do we want to take the 13th swing low? I like the I like I like grabbing this 13th swing low myself personally. Um, if you're gonna go across two days 
<laughs> Alright, so here's... I was back to next, next levels here. So those other levels gave us some more actionable, a little bit closer dialed in levels there, actually. So you see that it respected the, the 2x of that, not the 2x, but the, that's 076, the 2x of the delta is right there. So you take, what you do is you take the difference, right? So the delta, what I'm talking about when I say the delta is the difference between the swing low and the higher swing low that becomes your one level up here. So same should be the same distance. That's a 7.3%. So it should be, it should have drawn us 7.3%. Yeah, roughly the same distance, right, from your swing high up. That's your base level then. All right. Uh, that's interesting because you see this weight down there. Let's draw this out a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go to the 13th lobe if you go to this low. So I'm gonna give you some fib levels. This is, again, this is why I don't really like working with these extensions too much, but, you know, if you're trying to get super, if you're trying to find some more levels, but on the upside, let's see what we got here. 42, nine, 40, right at 50. And then we, yeah, so the next, this makes more sense on the next impulse though, that's 60,000. Right, that's kind of what I had in my head as the top of the next impulse would be between 50 and 60, which would give us, you know, you'd be coming into the 618 and the, the next the next two um, levels, not the 618, the 2618, double, triple. But those are just, those aren't fib levels anymore. Those are 1618 right there. There's your one level. All right, that was a fun experiment. It's so subjective. Is Heath on here? Heath, can you help us with this? This might be something Heath would do. <laughs> this is what I would say. Honestly, I would say that's the swing low, that's the swing high, and that's the swing low of this whole impulse. That's what I would say. These are the levels I'd be watching, personally. That's what I like. So, you see mine. Let's just do mine real fast. So, from that January 4th low, this is this basically gives us... So, what I'm doing is I've calculated... The reason I like this swing low is that if the computer doesn't like this as an impulse, but this is this is 2021. So we broke into 2021 right here, right? And so we were already in an uptrend. This is the swing low of 2021. This is the swing high of 2021. I mean, that's kind of not really disputed. And this is this is the first impulse. This is the bottom of the first impulse of 2021. It started in 2021 to the top of 2021 to the low point of 2021. That gives us fresh levels to work with. That would be the levels I'd be more interested in looking at personally, which we're not going to get up to 90,000 on the next impulse. But that gives us a 52,000 level and a 66,000 level. So the delta puts us up at... So in th what, what in theory should happen is as we break out of this downtrend that we're in now, Right, so we clearly see that we're in a downtrend. A downtrend, I mean, this wedge that we're in. When we break out of this wedge, in theory, if this is, if this worked out to be true, we should find strong resistance right here. And then and then make a really big move. Now, you're in reality, you're going to find resistance, obviously, at this swing high level. So also another thing that could happen is it does consolidate under that, breaks that, and actually comes back to this level and never touches that line to, to take it back off. That happens too from time to time. All right, enough on that. I'm not a fib expert. I've just seen them work, and I, I know people that are really good at that. That's what they use. I've seen them work. I've never been able to successfully use extensions. I, I, I could never get that right. I get range bound okay. Range bound's a lot easier. For example, let me go find a range bound period. Put this back on auto. All right. So if I'm wanting to see, okay, I see the sell-off that happened here, and I'm wanting to see what the price might do off after this sell-off. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take a kind of a much more clear example. This is how I've used them in the past. And there you go. It's that simple, right? Swing high, swing low. And then, so after this point, after we kind of double bottomed here, 
I would draw this out after it's obvious that we've kind of bottomed, right? And then I'd look at, then I have some levels to work with uh, for the next little bit of the range bound area. And you can see that if I keep drawing this out, it actually, price will actually very well respect these levels. Because computers use those levels. I'll turn this back off auto. You can see how well that worked. Until it started to really, you know, then, then you had another expansion phase and it no longer really worked that well. But anyway, a little fun experiment. I wouldn't recommend using them, but. How about ETH dumped to 1023? Jacob, was that you that talked about that the other day on our, our group? Good call if it was you. I'll put this back on auto. I don't think ETH's going to dump again, do you? We're back above 1200, which is a level I'd be keeping an eye on. But I think ETH is looking good. Uh, again, I, I have a hard time with the ETH USD chart. Because it's tracking, so much more tracking the Bitcoin chart. ETH BTC tells me that as long as Bitcoin doesn't dump again, that ETH's not going back down to 1000 because it's consolidating above this, this support. Like, so obviously ETH didn't. Look at the ETH BTC chart. Look at the ETH USD chart. You know, the, <laughs> the wick down was much more severe there than over here. So this tells me that ETH is holding strong um, its its breakout of this level of this downtrend, and now we're we're now counter trend. So this is, you know, if you can get in early counter trend, those are the best type of trades to get in because you can ride that wave for you know quite a while. So it's great to be able to get these early counter trends. That's what we've been watching very very closely. This breakout. So now that we're kind of, the market's showing us that, that it's going to respect this breakout and that ETH is now going to have some strength for a period of time here as we possibly bull flag. So I, I don't see ETH getting down to 1,000 again unless Bitcoin just has another big, you know, big, big spike down. I don't see that happening either. I think Bitcoin's kind of shown us we've got a little bit of a floor at 30,000. And the buyers came in strong right here at 30,000. And it dipped down below it. That was a liquidity purge, kind of, you know, take out the stops, sell off, a very voracious bunch of people panicking. And then you, you trip some stops and wick down, but then buyers bought it right back up. So I don't think we're going back below 30,000 in the immediate future on Bitcoin. Therefore, I don't think ETH is going back down to 1,000. And so ETH is more likely to break. Let's go back to my main charts. I think what's uh, what, what I'm watching on ETH is much more on this main chart, which I've got a lot more market structure to work with here, all these trend lines. Here's all my long-term trend lines on ETH. So here's my prime trend line down here. These are all clone trend lines. Uh, this is all shamelessly copied from Jordan Lindsay's work. And he's, he's uh, quite good at this type of TA. I need to extend these out. So what I'll do here is to make sure I get these all even. I'm gonna grab a couple of these lines. I'm gonna find my anchor point. My anchor point's the top of that wick right there, and I'm gonna draw these all out. Oh, that's not gonna work, is it? Oh well. You get the idea. I'm gonna delete this one and draw. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna clone this trend line right here. All right. So yeah, what I'm what I'm watching for, we broke a bunch of, we've broken all kinds of levels. We broke this ascending wedge that people were freaking out that we were an ascending wedge and everybody swore that we were gonna sell off when we get rid of this ascending wedge and then we broke out of it to the upside. I think the same thing's gonna happen. We we fought with this 620 uh, you know, weekly. This was the June 18th to 2018 weekly close. Um, I'm gonna get rid of a bunch of these lines I just don't need anymore. We fought with that level and then once we broke it, we made a big strong run, basically almost straight into the all-time prior all-time high. We had you know a little bit of consolidation, and then it got real volatile. Does this look familiar, by the way? As you, as you th think about this, does this look familiar? I watch these lines, way too busy. You say with this, what I, if this looks eerily familiar, it should. All right, take a look at that. Take a close look at that. Came up close, not quite, sold off, came into it, consolidated, came back up into it, and off it went. All right.
Take a look at this. Came up, got close, sold off, not quite, came up into it. Hmm. Hmm, looks eerily familiar, doesn't it? So there you go. That's what I think he's gonna do. Or oh, it's already it's already resuming back up here. So I came up close and you know we came back. We're gonna consolidate and then whenever we break out that all-time high, man, it's gonna be a rocket ship to I don't know maybe 3k, 2200 somewhere in that range. Um, does anybody have any good uh, good upside numbers for ETH after it breaks the all-time high? Other than my assertion that it might go to 3,000. We'll ask for some opinions on that. Let me draw this clone trend line there and. Maybe one right through here somewhere. Some more trend lines to work with when we start getting higher. But those are going to become like not very influential in the price action. It's so volatile right now. Um, all right. Carolyn Borden uses Fib extensions all the time to find price right to upside her steps. Setup includes 834 EMA crossing to get prior swing. I will go look at that. Thank you for sharing that, Nick. I will. Uh, I'll take a look at that. I've always been, you know, at the end of, at the end of the day, the the indicators I found the most useful are a price action, b horizontal support and resistance, c trend lines, d the moving averages, and e Fibonacci levels. And, and outside of that, uh, RSI is certainly useful, but I can get that on the charts without having to use a, a, a momentum indicator. CCI, RSI, all those are interesting, but you know you can get that. You, you can you can see it on the chart. You don't need an indicator to tell you what's going on with that. Like, I don't need I don't need a an RSI to tell me that Bitcoin's been on the weekly is really 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 heated. Speaking of, let's take a look at that. I also don't need an indicator to tell me that it's cooled off quite a bit and that it could start resuming here. But um, let's just take a look at that indicator real fast. Let's just see what the weekly RSI is. What got down to. So we, we, I pointed this out before in the live stream. That obviously last cycle we had a bunch of spikes up to near 90, right around 90, and we actually were higher. We got we, we were off to a hotter start this cycle than last cycle. But you know this first spike, 90 down to 60, up to 80, down to 50, up to 90, down to 50. Right. So this this is our first of many probable spikes in the bull market and this is the first of many probable sell-offs in the bull market so also be prepared for future sell-offs but um on the weekly it looks like on this feed i got down to only 77 so far another thing to keep in mind is that the rsi can cool down significantly while price either goes sideways or even up so price can be slightly going upward and the rsi can be cooling off so i can find an example of that it's happened on a bunch of charts. I just not uh, seen a clear example of it. Yeah, so basically look at this. So the RSI topped out right here, right? I'm gonna make, um, so the RSI right here is this price right here, right? And then the RSI here was the price was, so the, R, the price went up while the RSI went more or less sideways, right? So the price action got all the way up to here and the RSI was here and then look, at the price right you know here when the rsi was down here now look at the price when the rsi had cooled all the way off to like 40. so price was effectively like totally sideways and it cooled the rsi cooled down from 80 all the way down to 40. so rsi cooled off that much while price went totally sideways so don't think this is another kind of this is uh, why well, i think people get momentum indicator is way wrong. This is a momentum indicator. This is not a price action indicator. So the momentum was strongly upward and got overheated, overbought, and consolidation will cause these momentum indicators to cool off. So don't, you know, don't look at this and think that, that the instrument had to be selling off. It's just that the momentum had cooled off. So same thing can happen with these spikes, right? These spikes, go back here in history, see if I can kind of prove that point further. So the first spike we had in the bull market actually peaked before price peaked. 
interestingly enough, right? It peaked right through here, this weekly candle. And then we kept going up a little bit further, but because price and momentum had slowed down, the RSI was cooling off. So the price came in right here, corresponds right there. And look when the RSI cooled way off over here, look where price was, slightly up to sideways. So it doesn't mean that while the RSI cools off, we can just consolidate or even drift up slightly. So just remember that when you look at these R, like these indicators, these momentum indicators. But that was the first of many probable spikes in our bull market in Bitcoin. Oh, well, we've been going for an hour and a half, guys. All right, well, I think I'm going to wrap up here. I think we've had a really good session. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, let me just take a look at the comments before we take off here. So ETH and BTC are on steroids both ways. Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're live right now, Kenneth. <laughs> no, Kenneth, he was messing with you. Thanks so much for keeping up with everyone. Thank cool. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody joining on here today. It's been a fun session. I hope you all got something out of it. Uh, I got a new project to go research. That was um, the sandbox sand. I will try to do some research on that and report back to you guys. The one project I'll say that I brought up today. I brought up Ampleforth. I don't. I didn't want to bring it up as an investment, so don't go just buy Ampleforth because I still have. I'm still trying to wrap my head around. The, but it's if you're worried about stable coins, Ampleforth is an interesting project because it could. It's it's algorithmic driven. So if if stable coins get hit by regulation, you know, asset backed stable coins get hit, then Ampleforth is interesting. Um, Abe is the other one I wanted to talk about. I know Alan's big into that. Alan, maybe we can talk about Abe next time. But the one I'll bring up is Ren. Um, I brought up Synthetics last time. It's an interesting uh, watch. Obviously, it's the derivatives play. It's, the lead. it's, I think, the leader in the, the crypto derivatives. Ren is the other one because they're the ones that are doing the wrapped Bitcoin, which I think is, is important for the ecosystem moving forward, uh, being able to tokenize Bitcoin and other other blockchains. So Ren is, Ren is a player in that space to keep an eye on. So... So I brought up some new projects. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, Scott Minard claimed that BTC reached its peak of 2021 at 42,000. He sounds like he's wrong to me. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh -huh. We'll find out. Um, yeah, I doubt it. I doubt it hit its peak at 42,000. Ampleforth, SNX, Ren, all solid place. Thanks, South Brooklyn Moto. I'm buying Ethy. Luke, is that like Luka Doncic? Because I love Luka Doncic. He's my favorite basketball player. Thank you, man. <laughs> uh, appreciate it, Ohio guy. I need to figure out how, how Jordan gets comments up on the screen. I, I want to be able to get y'all's comments up on the screen, but I haven't been able to figure. He uses a different software than I do, so I haven't had a chance to play with his software. Um, I don't know, I'll have to look up who Scott Minard is. I don't even know who that is. You're opening a big short at 34k.5. Are you talking about on Bitcoin? Picks? 34 and a half, you're opening a big short on Bitcoin. Ooh, that sounds scary. Have, have you looked at this uptrend? It's up. Shorting in an uptrend's not a good idea. <laughs> you want to sell resistance in a downtrend, and you want to buy support in an uptrend. It's, I mean, the trend is your friend until the end. I don't know. You to each his own. You do what you want. It's your money. Oh, Guggenheim CEO. Oh, pff. yeah, right. Like I can't, like listen to those guys. Any of the big players. I don't listen to anything they say. From the same, so in the same country as Doncic, nice. All right, L R C and H E G I C, add it to the list. All righty, I'm, I'm putting it on the list right now. Actually, give me a second. I'm putting those two projects on my list. Paste is plain text. Paste without formatting. 
All right, cool. Thank you guys. Thank you all. I'm gonna light up the music here. Go back to Dogecoin. One more round of Doge. Also, again, back to Alan. Alan, let's get Alan up here. He's been he's been answering all y'all's questions. Go thank him by following him on Twitter. Is it at twenty cent? At twenty. There we go. At twenty ping three. His last tweet is hilarious. So everyone's in a panic given their Bitcoin and Michael Saylor discount. Human psychology never changes. What I recommend, uh, uh, um, Jim and I, for your first, I have a video, um, how, like the beginning, buying Bitcoin, the very beginning of buying Bitcoin. Go check out that video. Yeah, so go check out my How to Buy Bitcoin video, but Jim and I, I think it's the best on ramp. Luca, Luca Magic, Luca Legend. It's the great dirt, like I'm a Mavericks fan, so. So happy that I thought it was going to be Porzingis, the unicorn that was going to take over for Dirk, and I was, you know, I was all right with that. Porzingis is cool, but man, when we got Luca, oh, that was like the greatest thing ever. It's, a, it's the second greatest thing to beating the the LeBron, Wade, Bosch trio in the finals. That was the greatest moment as a sports fan in history, beating the big three, the super hype team, Dirk taking his first championship, best moment in sports. I miss Dirk, I miss Tim Duncan, I miss Kobe, for more than one reason. Uh, the good old days. Anybody here a basketball fan? An NBA fan? My brother's got a you know, sports review website. Alright guys, y'all take care, thank you.